So I'll introduce you today, uh, Steve Ma. Steve is the Director of Residential uh, Communities for Leading Age. For those of you unaware, Leading Age is the association that uh, Collington, as well as uh, uh, nearly every not-for-profit uh, senior serving organization across the country belongs to. Not only uh, are, is Collington a member of Leading Age uh, National, but also uh, Leading Age Maryland, of which I'm actually on the, uh, on the board as well. Uh, Steve Mogg, uh, the presentation he's going to give today, he actually gave a version of this to our board of directors when last year it was envisioned that we would enter soon a strategic planning process. And one of the things that came out of this in our deliberations with the Strategic Planning Committee was how can we then take information that is coming to board members and other individuals and how do we provide that education to residents and staff members so that we're all really coming from the same place of understanding before we begin an endeavor such as this. So uh, Steve uh, um, uh, has been gracious enough uh, to make the long commute from DC. He was happy to not have to go to Oregon or Florida or California, which uh, would also send him uh, in those routes as well uh, uh, during his daily uh, dealings. But um, Steve, I'll have you come up and sure. say a couple words about yourself and uh, start your presentation. Sure. <clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. Um, sound check, you can all hear me? Yeah. Hey, great. Um, yeah, I'm with Leading Age. We've got 6,000 not-for-profit members across the country that provide services to seniors as well as other um, disabled adults. Um, the presentation that I'm going to give is one that, as Marvel said, I, I gave to the board that I do to different kinds of groups across the country. Um, I've been with Leading Age for 10 years. Uh, I'm an attorney by training, uh, originally from Seattle. Go Huskies. Uh, I bleed purple and gold. Um, and uh, I've been, been in private practice for 20 plus years representing providers. So I've been doing the senior services um, uh, sector for over 30 years. Um, so broad depth and breadth of knowledge. Uh, what you're gonna hear today, as Marvel said, and I mentioned earlier, is a presentation that I do largely to boards of directors as they're trying to, to develop strategic plans and understand where the things are going into the future so that they can prepare themselves and develop a plan that is appropriate. Um, I've given this presentation to residents as well. I was in Oregon a week ago uh, giving this presentation to a group of residents and a number of communities. So um, it is something that, that I have um, presented to different kinds of groups across the country. And it really is kind of the, the um, 64,000 foot high level, what are the things that are driving our sector, that sector of providing services to seniors, particularly those in campus settings like Collington um, across the country. What kinds of things are really going to be the factors that you uh, and communities like Collington are going to have to consider in the next five to ten years as you plan for where you're going to go into the future. Um, we're, the sector itself, the, the um, the continuing care retirement community, lifetime communities, and I'll talk about that distinction in a minute, is much stronger than it was a few years ago. We went through the recession like everybody else. We had some distressed communities. We had a few bankruptcies, um, but that's largely gone past us. We're now starting to see some development, some new, built, new campuses being developed. Um, there's about 19 or 20 of them that are in planning stages to be open in the next four or five years, um, and which is a nice, uh, sign it really slowed down when we were in the recession 2010 11 12 and now things are picking up um, HCBS I'll use acronyms and try and um, uh, tell you what they are and if I forget uh, please raise your hand the other thing is if I say something that you've got a question about or have a, a um, don't understand we've got a small enough group we can try and, and raise your hands and, and I'll respond to it HCBS you see up there is home and community based services that is the kind of service that is designed to pr be provided in somebody's home to allow them to stay there and do what we call as aging in place. AL is assisted living. Um, and of all the areas of growth in the last five years, assisted living has been the highest growth, largely memory care, dementia care, Alzheimer's care, has been the biggest area of growth. Here are the four trends I'm gonna talk about um, and in, these, in the next uh, hour or so. Um, the changing consumer, we're moving from different generations into the future and that's going to have a tremendous impact on how we provide services and what we need to do to respond to a changing consumer. Second is health care reform. Um, and this is not the Obamacare kind of thing. This is fundamental changes to Medicare and to some extent Medicaid, but largely Medicare, that will dramatically change how our members have to deal with providing services to seniors who are Medicare eligible. 
The third is technology. We're undergoing a huge transformation in healthcare related technology. Tremendous growth, tremendous opportunities, um, and that is going to have a direct impact on how seniors receive care and the kind of uh, services that seniors can provide, and then workforce. Marvel just mentioned uh, workforce talent. Um, this is a new one. I just added this last year. We were spoiled during the recession because it was relatively easy to get new employees. That's not the case anymore. That's the, the, the single biggest thing that I hear across the country that's troubling uh, administration that are, that are operating communities is getting and retaining qualified workforce. So I've added that as a fourth big trend. All these things add up to a tremendous change in our structure. We're undergoing more change more rapidly than we have in any time in history. And it's, it means that a community like Collington really has to pay attention to what is happening and look forward as to how they're going to position themselves in five years, in ten years, so that they can respond to these challenges and these changes and be a viable community into the future. This is, uh, I just want to put a context and everything. You've probably all seen these kinds of uh, slides before. Um, you know, right now, everybody talks about the baby boomer coming, and us baby boomers are, are coming. As you can see, there's a huge population growth that will be baby boomers. Right now, the oldest of the baby boomers is 70 years old. So we haven't really started to impact the traditional senior services yet. Mm -hmm. We will. Right now, we're starting to, to develop our, our members, such as Collington, are, are providing services to people in the silent generation. Um, the other thing is one of the, mo one of the more important concepts to understand is transitions in care. Historically, our sector, the sector of providing services to seniors, has been pretty siloed. So we had each one of these, independent living, home health care, skilled nursing care, did that job, did that silo. They provided that care. So you knew how to run a home health care, home health care agency, you knew how to run a skilled nursing facility, you knew how to run assisted living. The only entity out there that knows across the board are our life plan communities, like Collington. Collington has all these under one campus where people can age and move and transitions. And the concept of transitions in care is something that's going to be very important in the future. It's a skill that, that our members have, staff at Collington, that we don't market very well that we don't go out to the marketplace and say, gee, we know how to help people successfully age. The rest of the sector, the rest of the people providing care and services to seniors tend to know one segment of it. As I said, they know how to run a home health care agency or they know how to run a skilled nursing facility. Collington knows how to not only run those, but provide the transitions of care. So you'll hear me talk in, in, uh, later in the presentation about some of those concepts, particularly in, with regard to uh, health care reform. The other component that is, the other trend that, that it plays in as the introductory part of this <clears throat> is the difference between needs and wants. The senior care sector has traditionally, historically been a need-driven sector. People need the services. They need to go to the nursing home. They need to go to the assisted living. They need to have home health care. Um, and that will continue. That will always be a factor in it. But what we're starting to see is a, a stronger component of wants. What do people want when they're receiving services? The first ones that started doing that, how many of you are familiar with the Dell Webbs or the Village uh, in Florida? Those started out a number of years ago recognizing that the younger seniors have wants. They want to be active. They want to play golf. They want to have social recreation activities. And so they were developed along those lines. That concept of wants is starting to become important in all components of health care. So even those in now that are in assisted living or skilled nursing, <clears throat> we're seeing more and more people who want to have certain things. They may need some services, but they also have wants. So we're going to have to start to recognize that the consumer is be becoming much more demanding than they have in the past, and they're going to want to have things that we're going to need to provide. Consumers are going to drive change. Now, historically, um, I didn't ask, do you know what your average age of entry? 78. Okay. Well, you're actually a little bit younger than, than some. I use 80. Most of our campuses across the country, the average age when somebody moves on to campus is around 80. Some a little bit higher. You guys are, are lucky a little bit lower at 78. So if you think back 80 years ago, that's 1936, and that's the generation that we're moving into called the silent generation. 
Up till now, we've prim been primarily serving the World War II generation, people born before 1930. Those have been our primary customer. Uh, we're now moving into a silent generation. The demands and the lifestyle and the, the uh, consumer orientation of the generations are significantly different and we're going to have to understand that if we're going to be successful into the future because the consumers, the customers, the people that we're trying to, to, uh, to uh, entice and, and try and market to move onto campus are going to be different as we move through the next 5, 10, 15 years. As I said, we've been dealing with the World War II generation. Now, I, when I do this in, with residents in the audience, I need to make a, a caveat. I'm going to be talking about generational cohorts in general, in big picture. Now, this may not apply directly to any one individual, so don't get mad at me if I say something that says, well, that's not the way I am. I'm talking about, in general, how these age differences are and what they represent. So we've been, repre we've been largely serving the World War II generation up till now. The attitudes and preferences of the World War II generation were largely formed by, obviously, two seminal events, the Great Depression and World War II. My dad, who's 91, he still well, has a hard time spending any more than he absolutely has to for clothing and for shoes and things like that. His attitude is, gee, you know, I don't want to spend any more than I have to because I've seen bad times and I want to make sure I'm secure. So their value system, based on experiences in the Depression, based on the, the uh, uh, World War II and the things that, that happened there both at home and, and in service, created a value system that's based on security and stability. That's what they value. So their goal was to have a career. They're the ones that worked at a, at a company or a factory for 25, 30, 40 years. Um, a roof over their head, they want to have that, that stability to make sure that they had some place, food on the table, very accepting of the status quo. One of my favorite uh, All in the Family uh, episodes from the 70s with Archie Bunker was burning his mortgage. That's a very World War II generation concept. Nobody burns mortgages anymore. Nobody lives any place long enough to burn mortgages. <laughs> that just doesn't happen. But that was the value system of World War II generation. I was at a board meeting a number of years ago and one of the board members said, you know, I hadn't thought about it, but I was out to dinner with my mom who was, she was 84, 85 at the time, um, World War II generation person <clears throat> for her birthday. They went to a nice restaurant. She decided to splurge and order a steak, order the steak medium rare. The steak came and it was cooked past medium rare and, her, and the board member, her son said, oh no, just send it back mom, you know, they'll cook you another steak. She said, oh no, 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 it's okay, I can eat it, I don't want to waste it. That's a World War II generation trait. Baby boomers would have said, I want that steak, give me a new one the way I want it. World War II generation, they don't want to waste something. You know, it was good enough for them. So they were very accepting of the status quo. They didn't push back. So as providers of services, it made it very easy for us to provide services because as long as we met their basic needs, <clears throat> security and stability, so as long as we had some place for them to sleep, as long as we had food on the table, as long as they felt secure and, and safe, they didn't push back. So when we set the schedule, Bingo's at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. We're going to the mall at 1 o'clock on Thursday. Breakfast is from 7.30 to 8.30. Lunch is from 11.30 to 12.30. Dinner's from 5 to 6. They said, fine, you know, that meets our basic needs. We're not going to push back. They may have grumbled some. They may not have liked all the menus. If we only had one or two choices in the meals, that was fine. They had food on the table. So it made it very easy for us to be providers of services because we could dictate what the services were, how they were provided, when they were provided, and our customers in, historically didn't push back. They didn't object. They didn't say, no, I want something different. So we got used to providing a, a fairly stable, secure, predictable system where we as providers, the people that operate communities, uh, made the, the choices. We're now moving into the silent generation. And that's a group of people who were born between 1930 and 1946. Now, th there's been some demographic studies of the silent generation, and, and it's a little bit um, different than some generations. The people that were born in the early 30s tend to be a little bit more like the World War II generation. But as we move into the late 30s and into the 40s, they're much more like the, the, the uh, baby boomers. <clears throat> because if you think about it, if somebody was born in, say, 1935, um, they probably don't really remember the Depression because by the time they got to be four or five years old, it was largely over. Um, 
for all intents and purposes. They remember World War II, but they didn't serve. They may have had brothers or uncles or, or um, fathers or something to serve, but it didn't impact them the same because they were too young. The silent generation pretty much came of age after World War II. And if you think of the United States after World War II, we all know what a huge boom and how things grew tremendously after World War II. And you think about the world after World War II. Of the four major economies, Great Britain, Japan, Germany, United States, three of those were decimated by the war. Not only were their physical, uh, plant, physical uh, characteristics, their buildings, their roads, their railroads, their, their industries decimated by the war, they also lost huge numbers of people. So it was a, took them a while to get back up into um, you know, being the economic powers that they are now. You all can remember in the 50s, as I can, when you talked about a, a something from Japan, a transistor radio, it was a cheap little piece of junk, you know, the, the cheap stuff that was coming from Japan. Well, we know what comes from Japan now. I mean, everybody's got Sonys and Samsungs and, and high-end TVs that are all Japanese, so they've made that transition. But it gave the United States a leg up. We had to retool after World War II, change from a wartime to a peacetime economy, but we didn't have to rebuild anything. And although we suffered significant casualties, we didn't suffer in proportion nearly as much as the rest of the world. So we had to leg up. And so the post-World War II era was a boom era. And that's when the silent generation people, uh, silent generation grew up. They grew up in the age when TV was developed. They grew up in the age when rock and roll started, um, when pop, pop culture started. So they're more consumer-oriented than the World War II generation. So as we move into the customers that we're starting to serve now, they're much more of, remember that slide I had earlier, but the needs and the wants? They have many more wants than our fourth generation before. The World War II generation didn't really have very many wants. You know, and the, what they did have were pretty simple, as I said. Security, stability, food on the table, roof over their head. That's all they wanted. The silent generation is starting to want more than that. They want to have social activities. They want to have choice. They want to have diversity of services. And as providers, we're having to shift to recognize that so that we can't just dictate what's going on as much as we're able to. We have to respond to a consumer, a customer, that is saying, wait a minute, I want to do this, or I want to go here, or I want this kind of service, or I want this kind of food. And that's going to be, that's a fundamental difference in how we've approached things. And it means that we as providers, have to start planning for this change in, in the consumer and customer that we've got into the future because it's going to continue that way. We've got a, a advantage right now is that there aren't as many silent generation people as the baby boomers coming along. You know, we've got 48 million silent generation, and there's about 78 million of us baby boomers. So we've got a huge number of seniors coming down the park. The silent generation also is better educated. If I was going to ask you what's one of the biggest pieces of legislation that was passed in the 20th century, what would response? GI Bill. GI Bill, you're absolutely right. The GI Bill was passed and although some of the World War II generation took advantage of that, many more of the silent generation did. Think about our, our system of higher education before World War II. Who went to college? Rich people. Rich people, exactly. You had to have money to go to college. Some athletes maybe, some people with talents. Um, uh, musicians, something like that, would go to college. But the average person, if they got through high school, would then decide, gee, am I going to stay on the family farm? Am I going to work in a factory? Am I going to learn a trade? That was a, the, the normal course of events. Very few people in proportion went to college. After World War II with the GI Bill, because lots of the silent generation served, um, that was very much the custom is to, to have a couple years of service, GI Bill became available, so they took advantage of that, and there was lots and lots of silent generation people who got college educations. The whole community college system across the country is a direct result of the GI Bill. They had to build this whole new system to help educate all these people that were now had this benefit of going to college. So that created a, a more affluent generation. The silent generation has um, significantly more resources than the World War II generation did. Silent generation is the last generation that has pensions. You know, us and the baby boomers have 401ks that drop to 201ks and work their way back up to being 401ks, you know, with the economy. But we don't have pensions. Silent generation, many of them have pensions. So they are significantly more affluent. 
they tend to, we're tending to see more married couples wanting to move into communities. That's largely because the guys are starting to catch up in age and length of life as the women. You know, again, the World War II generation and earlier, the, the women at 85 you know, hugely outnumbered the men. Well, now we're getting more and more men that are, are successfully aging, so we're seeing more couples moving in. Um, and, that's, you know, and that's changed the dynamics of, of what, we're, what our structures are, so we're seeing more couples. So the silent generation is very much a generation of um, transition from the World War II generation to what we're going to come to next, which is us baby boomers. You know, and we haven't been accepting of anything as status quo. Um, there was a group in Pennsylvania, Varsity, it's a marketing group, uh, group that did some focus groups and some surveys of seniors that, of the baby boomer generation that were the oldest of the seniors, those born in the, the 40s, and asked them about retirement and what they're see seeking into their seniors. And it's a very interesting report. They've done a couple of different things. But the conclusion, um, and this is a paraphrase, the conclusion were that the baby boomers expect a variety of choices and to have a voice in all decisions. As I said, I'm a born and raised Seattle kid. When I read that, what it reminded me of was the Nordstrom's way. The customer is always right. That's, what, that's the fundamental difference. The baby boomers don't accept what somebody else tells them. We've pushed back on everything that we've touched since we came along um, 50, 60, 70 years ago. So we're not accepting of the status quo. We have many wants. We have desires. And we've been catered to. I did this presentation, in fact, it was up in, in Kendall at, uh, in, in Hanover, and one of the residents at this point in time raised her hand, and I, I responded, she said, yeah, you're all spoiled. <laughs> yeah, we are. We're very spoiled. But that creates an attitude that is different, so that as a provider, as you are looking at what's going on in the future, and as you think about how do we structure a program that's going to be attractive to baby boomers, you have to recognize that they are going to have a tremendous number of wants. They're going to have lots of things that they want, much more than previous generations. We're the first ones to live in fully in the age of mass communications. We all grew up with TV. And then as TV has morphed into to what it is now in the computer generation, all that kind of thing. And I think that has created a different attitude. This is my own pet theory. You're not going to see this in any, any scientific journal or there's no research on this. This is my own sociology 101 theory. But I think the baby boomers, because we grew up in the age of mass communication um, and can reinforce that, are the first generation that is totally, really, really, really um, resistant to the concept of getting older. Don't call me old. Generations in the past, uh, I think, were a little bit more accepting of the natural progression of life. Particularly when we had an agricultural society because you saw it in the farms all the time. Birth, growth, death, those kinds of getting older. People knew that was coming and accepted that. The baby boomers aren't accepting that. And we can reinforce that feeling very easily. How many of you can remember that night? Sure. Now, as a baby boomer, I can remember that night sitting in my parents' living room, just excited as all heck, watching the Beatles. What did your parents think? Um, they were shaking their heads on this. Is, you know, really those guys with that floppy hair, and, you know, and, and my dad had a military-style crew cut. But I can reinforce. I can go back on YouTube and watch that any time I want. How about this one? We all remember this. I can remember sitting in my living room again with my parents watching that. My brother was next to me, my youngest brother, really mad because that was July 20th, 1969. His birthday is July 21st. And he wanted them to, to walk in the moon on his birthday. <laughs> but I can go back and watch that and remember being a 12-year-old kid or a 16-year-old kid and reinforce the fact that in my mind, I'm still young. I'm not, you know, so I think that the baby boomers, I'll, I'll be honest, on occasion, if I'm bored and don't have anything to do, I can go onto YouTube and watch Leave It to Beaver, one of my favorite shows when I was a kid. And, you know, th that show's been, been gone for 60 years. But I can revisit my youth 
And I think that's much more telling on the baby boomers. Now, older generations had music and books that would remind them of their, their youth, but nothing like what the baby boomers have to be able to reinforce the fact that, that they're young, that they feel young, that they're resistant to that old. So that's created a whole different expectations. Now, the marketing group at Varsity, and I'll give you some summary of stuff, broke down this and, and asked the baby boomers about a lot of different things. And here's some, some concepts that are important for us to understand if we're going to provide services to baby boomers into the future. Customizable living areas. Many of our communities are starting to move towards when somebody moves out of, the, out of an apartment, they go in there and pretty much gut it because the baby boomers don't want somebody else's choices. They want to have a control of their environment. So they don't want to move into somebody, some place that somebody else made the decision about what kind of countertops are there, what kind of cabinets are there. Is it a hardwood floor or carpet? Uh, what kind of drapes? What color is the wall, paint in the walls? So many of our, our communities are starting to say, okay, we're gonna have to redo our apartments every time somebody moves in because they're not gonna choose, they wanna want to, to choose what somebody else's choices were. And the configuration, open kitchens, you know, areas for business, uh, de you know, um, and uh, a lot of baby boomers are still doing work, are still doing part-time work, so they wanna have office kind of space. So all these things are, are responding to the demand of a consumer that wants to control their, their environment, wants their choices as to their living environment. Um, how many of you have watched those do-it-yourself shows like Home Hunters and, and you know, the remodeling shows? And how many times have you seen somebody walk into a house and say, oh, this is terrible, it's got to go, I can't stand this. And you look and you go, well, you know, that's really not too bad. I don't know what they're objecting to, but that's the baby boomers. We don't want to move into somebody else's white formica or birch-colored cabinets or carbon on the floor. You're worried to want to have a choice. And so we as providers, when I talk to boards, you have to understand that you're going to have to create more flexibility and respond to a changing con consumer, customer, who wants their choice in what's in that apartment that they're moving into. Healthcare. Uh, baby boomers want to know that there's health care available, certainly dementia care. Dementia scares baby boomers to death, largely because most of us have had experience with it. We've had some relative that has had dementia. We, we've seen it firsthand. We know what it's about. Now, we may not want to tour it. We may not want to see it. We want to know it's there. You know, you talk to the marketing people and, and somebody will come in and say, well, you want to see the health? No, we don't want to see the health care center. We just want to know it's there. Um, so that's, but it's important to us to know that we have that. Technology, you know, it's not, do you have Wi-Fi? It's, you don't have Wi-Fi? Or in 2025, whatever the latest and greatest is. Because the baby boomers, the silent generation to some extent, certainly the, the younger of the silent generation, but the baby boomers certainly, we're all tech savvy. I mean, we all have got iPads and iPods and, and and smartphones and those kinds of things and, and that's part of our life and so we're going to expect that technology savvy community when we decide to to look at communities at when we when we start to get in our late 70s so whatever the latest and greatest in technology is we have to respond and that's always difficult because technology is not necessarily cheap and certainly in a campus environment like this putting in wi-fi those kinds of things is not an inexpensive proposition but i can tell you if you don't the baby boomers are going to say, I don't want to move there. I mean, yeah, that's, they're, they're old fashioned. So whatever the technology starts to evolve over the next five to 10 years, you're going to have to, as a campus, look at that and say, we're going to need to keep up with that because our customer in the future is not going to move, want to move into some place that's behind the times. Dining choices. World War II generation, what are they? Meat and potatoes. You know, one or two entrees, a couple choices, pretty basic kind of food. Nowadays, what do we have? I, two of my daughters are vegans. I'm a red meat carnivore. I make no apologies. But two of my daughters are vegans. And that's becoming very common. Vegetarians, vegan, gluten-free, other kinds of diets, you know, um, exotic foods, sushi, things like that. That's second nature to the baby boomers. So our dining services are going to have to respond to those. So it's going to be much more of a restaurant style. It's not going to be, here's three choices of entrees. It's going to be, here's six entrees, and here's four different kind of salads, and here's this, and variety of options for dining. Baby boomers are going to want to have some place to go sit down and have a nice meal, if they choose, but they're also going to want to have a bistro, cafe. They're also going to want to have a grab-and-go. 
Um, you know, back to the customizable living areas, we're going to want to cook. I love to cook. I want to have a kitchen that's got a gas stove and room to be able to prep food. Now, I may not cook as much as I think I'm going to, but don't tell me I can't. Because that's, that, you know, that's the, the baby boomer's attitude is, you know, I wanted that, that choice. So you're going to have to have a variety of ways for people to serve. And then one of the can issues that we still have on occasion across the country is alcohol. You know, trust me, in a couple of states and, and more coming, I think, alcohol is going to be the least of your problems. Um, if you're in Colorado or Washington, alcohol is, that's ancient history. They're dealing with whole other issues now. But for better or worse, that's been the lifestyle of the baby boomers. So we've got a, a member in Colorado, Boulder, Colorado, where the, the gentlemen got together and they started a brewery. They brew their own beer. You know, wine tastings, wine socials, cocktail hours. We've got a number of communities I've been in where you walk in and, and here's a uh, full-fledged bar you know, around the corner for people to go have drinks after five or sometime. I've seen a couple of communities where they've created pubs, um, sports-oriented pubs for the, the men that are living there with pool tables and big screen TVs and, and um, uh, beer uh, dispensers so that you know, they create this atmosphere, which is what the baby boomers like. I travel a lot. Uh, all over the country, and if I'm in a part of the country where I'm unfamiliar with what's there to, to, uh, for restaurants, if I see something that says sports pub, I'll go there because that's my comfort level. I mean, I'm a sports guy, you know, going to have a beer, have a burger, have a steak, those kind of things. And that's the attitude, atmosphere that our communities are going to have to start to foster because that's what the baby boomers are going to look for. The variety of choices, different kind of options, the ability to have uh, drinks and, and uh, wine and beer and socials. A variety of amenities, amenities and programs. We're going to have to start to respond to the, the varying uh, hobbies and attitudes of the baby boomers as to what they want to do. The best of our communities now don't have activities programs anymore. We used, every campus used to have an activities coordinator. Activities coordinators are going away because that was, again, that was the World War II generation approach of we'll decide what the activities are and when they're scheduled, and then you come to the activities. Now it's being flipped. And we have uh, lifestyle facilitators, coordinators, who ask residents when they move in, what do you like to do? What are your hobbies? We've got communities where some of the men have gotten together and formed a rock and roll band. Um, you know, we've got all kinds of things across here, book clubs and wine clubs. And you know, some of our communities, you know, they have pottery studios, they have woodworking studios, they have art studios, um, all kinds of, of um, uh, yoga and Tai Chi and, and all the swim programs, all these, because the baby boomers have all these interests and we have to respond to that. Educational interests. One of the largest growing areas is affiliations between campuses and educational institutes because, again, one of the characteristics of the baby boomers is they still kind of, they still want to learn things. They still want to be active and, and involved in the community and take classes. So affiliations with colleges so that you can go to a um, audit classes on campus or they, you can bring somebody from the campus over for lectures. So all those kinds of things are all being um, developed as the, the providers start to see more and more of that wants. Remember the want side. And lastly, spacious rooms and storage. And I don't know how you are, but I need a place to put my stuff. So that's what I've been doing back there, just trying to find a place for my stuff. You know how important that is. That's the whole, that's the whole meaning of life, isn't it? Trying to find a place for your stuff. That's all your house is. Your house is just a place for your stuff. If you didn't have so much goddamn stuff, you wouldn't need a house. You could just walk around all the time. That's all your house is. It's a pile of stuff with a cover on it. You see that when you take off in an airplane and you look down and you see everybody's got a little pile of stuff. Everybody's got their own pile of stuff. And when you leave your stuff, you've got to lock it up. Wouldn't want somebody to come by and take some of your stuff. They always take the good stuff. They don't bother with that crap you're saving. Ain't nobody interested in your fourth grade arithmetic papers. They're looking for the good stuff. That's all your house is. It's a place to keep your stuff while you go out and get more stuff. Now, sometimes, sometimes you've got to move. You've got to get a bigger house. Why? Too much stuff. You've got to move all your stuff. And maybe put some of your stuff in storage. Now imagine that, there's a whole industry based on keeping an eye on your stuff. 
Enough about your stuff, let's talk about... <laughs> Baby boomers have stuff. We've got kayaks, we've got bikes, we've got rollerblades, we've got skis. Don't tell us we can't have our stuff. We may not use it. I've got a bike in my basement that I have ridden road for six months. But don't tell me I can't have that. Communities are going to have to recognize that and have storage space for stuff. Very few campuses across the country that I've been in actually have storage space. You know, they've got closets for clothes, but they don't have a place where somebody can store a kayak or skis or bikes. Baby boomers are going to want to keep that stuff. Even though we don't use it as much as we think we're going to, don't tell us we can. So in the future, our campus members are going to have to, to respond to this really strongly changing um, demographic and customer. What we're going to have to do, instead of just being a, a community where somebody comes to live, we're going to have to facilitate their lifestyle. Because if we don't, they won't want find it attractive want to move in there. Uh, we have to create the experience of successful aging. There's a book called The Experience Economy that talks about how our, our economies have changed over the years. We started out, obviously, agrarian agriculture economy, moved into the industrial economy, moved into the service economy. They argue that we're now moving into the experience economy. And the successful business in the future will have the experience. Think about Disney World and Disneyland. That's an experience. You don't just go to ride a roller coaster. You go for the experience of going to Disney World. Starbucks, you don't just go buy a cup of coffee. You're going to the experience of buying coffee. And the whole attitude is having that experience. And so we're going to have to develop the, the programs and services and campuses, both the physical plant and the programs, that will facilitate that experience, that will facilitate the lifestyle, if we're going to be successful to market to somebody in 2025, which is only nine years away. It's, it's starting to creep up pretty quickly. Innovation and flexibility are the key. We have to be more innovative and we have to be more flexible. One of the, the uh, difficulties we have as a not-for-profit provider and not-for-profit sector is we're not very flexible and we don't move very fast. And if things start to change, we form committees and we talk about it and we talk about the board and then we, we have some recommendations and then 18 months later we make a decision. That's way too slow. You know, we're going to have to become much more nimble to be able to respond to changes as they come. And then lastly, you've heard me talk about life plan community. The terminology we've been using historically for a campus like Collington is continuing care retirement community, CCRC. When they've done, we've done some focus groups and some other people did some focus groups with the baby boomers and said, well, if you're thinking about the future, would you consider moving into a continuing care retirement community? 80 plus percent of them said, no, absolutely not. I'm not moving to some place that, that, that is care, and I'm not moving to some place that's retirement. That's not who I am. So don't, you know, continuing care retirement community was totally unattractive to, to baby boomers, the oldest of the baby boomers. So we started a year ago, uh, launched a plan to try and get that terminology changed. And what we're trying to, to promote now is called life plan communities. Because if you think about it, if we've got a consumer that is a customer that's very consumer oriented and we're going to have to try and facilitate a lifestyle, the worst thing we can do is start off using a name that is a barrier to begin with, that we've got to overcome what, and try and describe to them how great a continuing care retirement community is when the first thing they think about is, I don't need care and I don't want to retire in a traditional sense. So we're promoting the terminology life plan community as a way to be a positive response for the market, for the consumers into the future as to what they're getting into, what's this animal that somebody's asking them to come consider as a place to live. The other question, yeah. Uh, there's a wrinkle on this in terms of people who are making a choice about long-term care. And the CCR, the, the continuing care part of that name says, I don't, I'll pay lots to come here. I don't have to cover long-term care insurance. Yeah, and that's, the, the whole issue of long-term care insurance is one that is, is really difficult right now because of, of the way the policies are. Um, but again, I think that the, at, the component of care can be explained when you talk to somebody about a life plan community.
you plan for taking yourself in the future. That's the kind of person that is typically attracted to a campus setting like this. You all, you are mostly planners. You were worried about what was going to happen. You wanted to make sure that you, you had your basic needs taken care of. So you're planning, and that's what we're trying to attract to, is a senior that is willing to plan for their future. And we can explain what the plan is, including the, the healthcare component to it. The other thing that I get asked, yes? Uh, you kind of glossed over a long-term care as being long-term insurance. I think you missed a big point back there when you had what boomers want. You put health care and said nobody wants to see what their health care is. But one of the most important aspects of the health care we're depending on is assisted living. And you haven't talked about what people want in assisted living. They don't want to reverse back to World War II standards. They want modern standards, 21st century standards. And you gloss it over by saying people don't want to see health care. I think you really need to go back and hit that hard. Okay, well that's a good point. Um, the slide that I had early on with the wants and the needs, uh, remember I mentioned that needs is becoming a more component, and that applies to assisted living and skilled nursing care for that matter. People are going to want to have a different kind of a setting. They're going to want to have more amenities. They're going to want to have nicer rooms. They're going to want to have more things going on. So the, this concept of a consumer that is more demanding crosses all sectors. So every one of the sectors that we deal with are going to be touched by this, this desire to want. We're going to need to be better about providing those things that consumers want, including assisted living. Although, again, from a baby boomer perspective, we want to know that that's what it's like, but we don't necessarily want to go visit it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's very reassuring in some ways because actually a lot of what you, it's very reassuring what you said because, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. As a result of our pro first stage strategic planning process, we actually do a lot of what you talked about doing, far from all of it. And the very fact of this gathering suggests we really moved in the direction of a far more participatory planning process for the future. Um, so let me push you a little. Okay. okay, this is Washington DC. Sure. We've got a lot of people who've been here involved in shaping government policy, in shaping broad social policy beyond government, and in creating innovations, and who still want to be useful in continuing to do that. So my question is, how can our strategic planning process not only make this the model, but also make sure that it really moves the debate forward, not just what are the trends in the industry, but what do we want to make the trends in the industry, and how do we want to use the opportunities of the kind of changes that we have here into grabbing them? And you know, we make choices as societies, and those are based on what people ask for and not. Sure. So it's a big question, but but I think there are a lot of people here who would like to think of our the broad participation we're about to have in those big terms. So thanks, it's been incredible. That's a great question. Um, and I think that, that you are, um, I was going to say unique, but you're not unique, but you are tapping into a resource. When I do these, these presentations for boards and I'm standing in front of a, a, a group of board members, there's two things that I always remind them, or actually three things that I always remind them. First of all, you develop your programs and services in the future from a position of strength. So you have to make sure that you're operating as well as you can right now in order to be able to move into the future. The second thing is that the education of boards and residents is a critical component. Um, presentations like the one I'm doing, other kinds of presentations about technology, for example, <clears throat> and other topics, help you give the educational base to be able to make strategic decisions in the future um, with, an with an understanding of what's going on. So you're, you're making decisions again, from a basis of, of knowledge and understanding, not guesswork. And the third is participation with residents. We have a huge untapped resource in many of our communities of residents who, as you just accurately described, have been great innovators, great um, policy developers, uh, worked you know, long, long careers that can help you fit, make decisions about how things should be structured in a community and provide input. So that's the third thing I tell boards is, is involve the residents. 
Get them involved with the committees, like I, the committee I sat in this morning with residents on it. Um, make sure that you're getting the feedback and input from them, uh, because that's something, again, remember the baby boomers phrase, you know, a voice in all decisions. Baby boomers are going to want to have that voice. So those are the three things, and, and I think that's how you develop the programs in the future that, that can become what the, the best practice is, what the best is. So how do we respond? Yes? You're changing CCRC to life plan community. Correct. I would suggest you get something other than that because life plan communities are about halfway down to where they will be antiquated. You'll have to find a new word. Jump to the next level. Okay, I'll pass it on. That's a good point. I have been here almost 16 years now, and I, I've been very happy most of the time. I was very active in my previous life in a responsible position. I am now getting older, like most of us. I am not as quite as independent as I was. I still have no help. I don't want it, but I would like a little more responsive response from the community in the way of medical services, the clinic, uh, repairs when they're needed. I mean, not just the superficial thing that they have to come in and fix. I have not received that and I'm getting very unhappy. Well, I, th I think you've, you've made your point, but, and again, that's something that we as a communities are going to have to respond to is a more active resident with more demands to respond to, to concerns like you have, and I'm sure that that was duly noted by the people here. So where are we going in the future now for members? Um, they're looking at two components. The, the left side is services, because a large part of what we do is service-oriented, HCBS, home and community-based services, bringing things into places where people live. PACE program for the all-inclusive care of the elderly is a Medicare Medicaid program that, that coordinates services and works on transitions. The other side is physical plan, expansions, new communities, act, affiliations, uh, mergers, something that you experienced here at Collington not, not too long ago with Kendall. Um, and those are the other side of the, the, the equation that members are looking at. So what do you analyze? What does a community do? Well, they have to look at your future customer and know that that future customer will want an updated and attractive physical campus. You want a physical, the, the appearance to be as, as modern and uh, attractive as possible. We know we're gonna have to have lots of diversification choices and services, so an active analysis of what you provide and, and who you provide it to. We know there's gonna be lots of uh, consumers coming forward. One of the questions that I always get is, well, gee, you know, the, the baby boomers, we read all these things about, they haven't saved any money, you know, the average 401k is $50,000 or something like that. How could they ever afford to move into a community? Well, <clears throat> remember, if there's 78 million baby boomers, if even only 10% have some resources, and, and I would suspect that it's going to be larger than 10%, that's 7.8 million people. Right now, we serve about 850,000 people on campuses like this across the country. So there's going to be plenty of people with resources to move into a campus like this if they find it attractive. Um, let me jump over there so for the sake of time. <clears throat> Pursu uh, boomers want to stay in their homes. Of all the slides that I'm going to tell you, this is probably the single most important one from a ca campus-oriented perspective. 80% of seniors, when they're surveyed, 80-plus percent, say they want to stay at home as long as they can. When you look at the market penetration rate, there's a group that looks at across the country and how many seniors are actually living in a campus setting or a congregate living setting like Collington is about 8 to 12 percent across the country. <clears throat> so that developed what I call my 90-90 rule. 90 percent of the seniors say they want to stay at home and 90 percent of the seniors are in fact staying at home. So that's the, the competition. That's where the customer is staying. That's your real competition from a con uh, community standpoint. It's not somebody building a new campus down the street. It's the seniors that are staying at home by choice because they don't want to move. That's the biggest competition you have and I'll expand on that in a few minutes. But that's the thing that you need to, I think, need to keep in mind is that's who you're going to have to try and attract and entice that seniors whose preference is to stay at home and increasingly will have the ability to do that. 
So what are members doing? Um, innovations in service delivery, trying to figure out different ways to provide services. Um, you talk about the healthcare component, small mo house models for settings. So the assisted living and the skilled nursing aren't the old corridor down the hall kind of approach. They're, they're what we call small house or greenhouse, where it's like a living environment in a family home with a central living room and a kitchen and bedrooms around the outside edge, kind of like a family home, not a long uh, hallway. Much more attractive, something is, that is um, better performance and a program that attracts the consumers much better than the old style we've had. Person-centered care, um, there's a lot of movement now to try and respond to the customer. Again, going back to what I was talking about earlier, the World War II generation, we dictated to them what's going to happen, when things were done, when meals were, when baths were, what the food was. Person-centered care is a response to the new consumer that flips at 180 degrees, and when somebody moves into a community, they ask them, when do you want to get up? What do you like to eat? When do you want to have a bath? When do you want to have programs? So the services are provided on their schedule according to their wants and needs, not dictated by the community. Affiliation with village programs. Are any of you familiar with the concept of village networks? Oh, we've got a couple. Um, started in Boston, Beacon Hill. It's, it's a uh, program where people that live in a geographically design, defined neighborhood are, uh, have a number of seniors that are aging in place. And they get together, usually pay some small dues, and work on, sometimes with volunteers, sometimes with paid staff, <clears throat> but work on ways to allow them to stay in their home longer. So they have coordinated services for transportation, uh, for snow removal, for yard work, for roof repair, uh, all those kinds of things that make it are more difficult as you age to, to allow you to stay at home. And many of our members, um, one in Alexandria, Goodwin House, is affiliating with five different village programs in the, the Northern Virginia area and providing services to that, that group of seniors um, knowing that most of them will never move onto their campus, but all of them need services, and they can provide that services. Remember, this is where I start to try and tie things together. Remember that slide that I had at the beginning where we talked about the transitions of care and the fact that our campuses provide all different kinds of care. We've got the expertise to help those people success, more successfully age in their own homes, and that's what our member, many of our members are doing with affiliating with village programs. Continuing care at home taking that concept that we've uh, established in a campus like this and moving it into a home setting where somebody pays some money but doesn't move and the services are provided to them in the home um, and they're care coordinated and there's health related services um, and uh, lifestyle kinds of services. Again, a consumer that's not going to move to the campus but still is going to need services and who better to do that than a campus? You already know how to do that because you provide that level of care on your campus. Many of our members are starting to take that out into the community, creating these continuing care at home programs. And then affordable housing with services. I heard Marvell mention earlier talking about um, providing services to, to low and moderate and income seniors. That's a tremendous societal issue we've got in the future. Um, you know, the, the numbers are just staggering. You know, for our low income senior housing, we have a large number of our membership in the leading age of low income senior housing. For every apartment that becomes available, there's at least 10 people on a waiting list. Um, so we've way, way, way underfunded and inadequate uh, choices for seniors. So that's another area to look at. Here's a couple of quick examples of how communities have integrated in the community. Edenwald, not too far from here over Townsend, <clears throat> they allow people from the outside to come in and eat lunch in their restaurant. Um, brought in some people, brought in some revenue, changed the vibration, vibe of the community. So we're moving from a fee-for-service basis. Remember that slide that I had at the beginning with all those different components? Historically, Medicare has had a payment system based for each one of those. So if you're a skilled nursing facility, you get paid. If you're a home health care agency, you get paid. If you're a hospital, you get paid. If you're a doctor, you get paid. And it didn't make any difference who did what because everybody got paid. We're now moving to a risk and quality-based system where you're going to have what are called capitated rates. And I'll explain how that works in a minute. So that it will make a difference what each one of those components do it because they're going to have to coordinate and, and integrate their care. The other side to it is population health. How do we manage those people with chronic conditions? The numbers are staggering. You know, for 20% you know, of the people on Medicare use 75 to 80% of the resources. And we need to do a better job of managing those people with those chronic conditions um, in order to save money. 
the old fee-for-service system, it didn't make any difference because every time somebody got sick or needed a service, they got paid. So you went to the hospital, hospital got paid. You went for rehab to the nursing home and the nursing home got paid. Oh, you had to go back to the hospital, the hospital got paid again. So it didn't make any difference what was going on. That's changing. We're going to have to change the dynamics for that. So we're shifting out of fee-for-service. We're moving away from a fee-for-service system and coming to a capitated rate system. Um, providers are going to have to understand what they do and know their costs and know how they perform because it's all going to be data driven. You're going to have to be able to show to the people that are controlling the money what your performance is in order to play in the healthcare game in the future with Medicare. It's not enough to just say, oh, I, I do a good job. You're going to have to be able to demonstrate that and to know what your, your data shows. So, for example, know what your rehospitalization rate is. Know what your average length of stay is. Know how much it costs you to provide care based on the diagnosis. So you're going to need to understand how much does it cost us to provide rehab services for a hip fracture, for example, or a stroke rehabilitation, or all these different kind of components. <laughs> sure. Um, healthcare reform is, is changing from a capitated, from a fee-for-service to capitated rate. It's a program that's being initiated by the federal government in Medicare that's a perfect example of where we're going in the payment system and it's for knees and hip replacements. That is the largest area for Medicare expenditures is knees and hips and so they are creating, they've got a pilot program going on in 67 different cities that's a mandatory program so everybody in those 67 cities are going to be in this bundled payment program. So what happens is the federal government says I'm going to pay this hospital $20,000 for 90 days of care for somebody who needs a new hip. And the hospital, that's all the hospital is going to get paid, is that $20,000. So it's up to them to figure out how they're going to provide services and who they're going to contract with for, for rehabil rehabilitation services, for example, in order to get that person through the hip replacement surgery and into the, the um, um, post-acute post rehabilitation service. It's not going to be fee for service. They're not, if, if that person ends up going back to the hospital, for example, and costs more than $20,000, the hospital's not going to get any more money. They're only going to get that $20,000. And that kind of a capitated rate system where a set amount of money is going to be paid for different kinds of services is becoming and will become an increasingly important component for Medicare. And in fact, by 2020, Medicare is going to have 80% of all the money they paid in some kind of capitated system. Um, there will be about 20% for those really complex, complicated care that, that, that don't fit into that. But all the things that, that Medicare spends money for, stroke, rehabilitation, congestive heart failure, hips and knee replacement, um, heart attacks, all those kinds of things that are the bulk of what Medicare pays for are all going to be in a capitated rate system so that what that means for providers is they have to understand what their cost of care and what their quality is in order to provide. Because here's the scenario. The hospital is going to have $20,000. There'll be probably more, but just for example, $20,000 to provide this um, knee replacement. Then they're going to look around and say, well, we're going to keep the person in the hospital for a couple, three days. Here's the comprehensive. This is the one I was just talking about. So that, that if the hospital is getting paid twenty thousand dollars, they know that they're going to only have the person in the hospital for a couple three days. But then they're going to need to have post-acute care, the rehabilitation side of that. They're again, then going to go out to the community and look at all the rehabilitation options and find out which ones are the most cost-effective. And they're going to want to partner with them because again, they want to minimize the amount of money they're going to have to spend. So if skilled nursing facility A says, oh, gee, it costs us $10,000 for what you're wanting us to do. And facility B says, oh, our cost is $13,000. Who's the hospital going to contract with? The two that provides $10,000. So if you as a Medicare provider aren't figuring out what your costs are and, and what your quality is, at some point in the future, whoever is controlling the purse strings, most commonly a hospital, is not going to want to do business with you. So for residents here in Collington, you go to the hospital for a hip fracture and you have to have post-acute care, you may or may not be able to come back to a skilled nursing community 
on the campus. The healthcare system may require you to go someplace else. So those are the kinds of things that our providers are having to start to figure out, is how do we do things to maintain our position with Medicare, and what does that mean? We have to understand what our cost of care, how much does it cost us, Collington, to provide rehabilitation care for a hip or a knee or a stroke or a heart failure? Because we're going to have to explain that to the hospital if they're going to want to do business with us. The other one is population health. As I said, people with chronic conditions, multiple chronic conditions, people that have congestive heart failure and diabetes um, and hypertension, those are the kind of people that drive lots of expense in our healthcare system and we're having to start to, to respond to those. Here's two examples of programs. As I said, historically, there was no incentive to manage the care for those people because everybody got paid on a fee-for-service basis. Now they're starting to come up with incentives to help manage the care. And here's two of them. Uh, one is a uh, wellness program. And some of this just seems like common sense, but nobody's ever tried it because nobody ever have to, where they actually are paying some skilled nursing facilities and doctors some extra money for some extra training and equipment to keep people out of hospitals, to, to manage their health and say, okay, we know this person's at risk because they've got multiple chronic conditions. Now let's put some more resources to them in order to keep them healthier and keep them out of the hospital. It's the Fram oil filter, pay me now or pay me later. And they're looking at ways to do that in different components and targeting money to that. That's what hasn't happened in the past. Nobody's getting paid to manage the care for these people. Now they're starting to get paid for it and the expectation is that they will reduce the overall cost of health care because they won't utilize the services of the, the hospital nearly as much, which is the most expensive setting. The other one is um, for people who are at risk of type 2 diabetes. They set up a pilot program where they hired some wellness, some health coordinators, they hired some dietitians, they hired some exercise people to help those people lose some, a little bit of weight, get more exercise, have a little bit better diet, and surprise, surprise, they saved money because these people didn't develop the chronic conditions that, that go along with type 2 diabetes, and they actually quantified that, and they saved $2,650 per year per person, and the program didn't cost that much. So they were actually having a net savings. But again, kind of simple. I mean, we all know if we have at risk for type 2 diabetes, well, all of us, eat better, get more exercise, live healthier. It's going to have better health outcomes. But they're finally targeting money to encourage people to do that. And they're finding they can save the healthcare system money. So that's the other side of healthcare reform. So not only are we going to have a change in structure as to how Medicare pays for services, we're also going to have efforts to help manage the health care of people because that will save money. And those are both two very important components for a campus like Collington to understand so that you can become a player and maintain a position in the Medicare system in the future. Third one, technology. Um, technology in two ways. One is technology that supports people living at home or living where they want to choose and technology that is important for health care reform. Remember that's, that slide I had about baby boomers want to stay at home. Let me paint you a scenario. It's 2025 or 2026 and the first of the baby boomers are turning 80 and some of them are looking at a campus uh, to move on to. What's the demographic for most of the people that move on to the campus? Well we can assume, that's for sake of argument, that it's a couple um, they've got resources, they've saved money, they've got, and they're able to afford to move on to campus, so obviously they've got some, some resources. They probably have a family home, and they're certainly technology savvy. Well, there is a tremendous amount of technology that's being developed to support, to help people stay at home, and if that is available, why would somebody want to move? Why would you move on to a campus if you can get technology that, that helps you interact with the world? You know, the Skype kinds of technology um, that hooks you up with your health system and your doctor so that you can report your health status to your physician on a regular basis and never have to go to, to their, their office. Um, all these kinds of things that are, and I'll give you some examples in a minute, all these kinds of things that are being developed in a very rapid, billions of dollars, Googles and Microsofts and Intels are all spending tremendous amounts of money because they see this huge market of seniors coming down the pike, baby boomers, who are all going to want services 
and who are going to be technology savvy and so they're developing t technology based service packages for them and that's going to be the um, available to them living in their own home so if they can get all these things that will help them stay at home why do they move including the biggest issue is social isolation that's one of the largest reasons people want to move in campus is for the social where they have you know they have the ability to interact with people well there's applications for example there's a program out now for seniors that hooks them up to educational inst to lectures where you log on to the computer and you see the lecturer and then up to 12, I think, people all have their faces on their live cameras that are listening to the lecture and it's interactive. So that I can listen, I can raise my hand and ask a question, I can hear if somebody else asks a question. Um, there's all kinds of these technologies where they're interacting people. We had a member in, in um, New York City that developed a program where they had some homebound seniors who couldn't get out of their apartments and they hooked them up to the senior set a live through a live video and they could interact with people at the senior center talk to them they could talk to us they could hear what's going on they could interact so there's an increasingly developed programs that will help people stay at home and still have the ability to have some kind of social interaction to respond to that social isolation here are some examples and this is the, I love this slide because it's lots of fun um, honor and carelink are uber like apps so these are all App, application based, computer application based, where a caregiver can be uh, hired via this, via this app and it's paid for through a credit card or a debit card, so there's no money that hands. And CareLink, for example, they only hire 5% of the people that apply. They're all licensed, they're bonded, they're insured, they're certified, um, very carefully managed. CareLink's biggest advantage is because there's no physical plant, there's no bricks or sticks, they actually charge less than your typical home care agency and they also pay their staff a little bit higher because they don't have the, the margin. So becoming a very successful, it's great for two or three hours a day, you know, four or five times a week, somebody come in and help you, um, you know, do laundry or provide some monitoring for care. Scout is an app that helps <clears throat> monitor health conditions um, blood pressure, temperature, heart rate, they're working on one for your analysis. I don't know how that's going to work, but that's what they say. Um, but there's a lot of these technologies that will directly link you to healthcare providers so that if you've got chronic conditions like type 2 diabetes, you can have your blood sugar monitored by a healthcare professional on a regular basis and never have to leave your house. Um, blood pressure, the same kind of thing. So again, ways to maintain your health status without having to go visit somebody. Um, in Japan, they're going to give an iPad to all the seniors loaded with health information stuff. They figured out that the, the, the hardware, the, the iPad, is cheap. It's all the applications that they can put on it that are going to drive the, the economy and have some money. Chefs for seniors. This is my favorite. This is a, a group out of Chicago that's looking to expand across the country. And as you can see, for a, for a nominal fee, $15, um, and plus the cost of groceries, They'll come into your home, they'll go to the store, come to your home, cook five to seven meals, put them in your refrigerator for you every week. So for you know, maybe $120, $130, you have meals every day, all week long, and you don't have to leave. What a great deal, you know, gee, and these are all well-balanced, chef-prepared meals. So again, one of the reasons, one of the things that drive people to have to move out, you know, is I don't want to cook anymore. Well. This is take care of it. All you have to do is heat it up. It's already pre-cooked. And you can choose, choose the recipes and the menus according to your likes and, and needs. Transportation. Um, I don't have it on here, but Uber, you're all familiar with Uber? No. Yeah. Uber is developing a um, program that is designed for seniors. They're actually pilot testing it with some members across the country where the, the cars are all uh, senior friendly, easy to get in and out of, and the drivers all have some training of dealing with seniors. And again, the application will be just like the regular Uber is you just use your phone and request a ride, and the, the Uber driver that's geared towards seniors shows up. Transportation is one of the biggest issues we have across the country for seniors. You know, if Uber and the others start to develop programs that do that, again, another reason to say, why am I going to move? Why would I move on to a campus if now I can get my health care monitored, 
I can have uh, interaction with people through technology, through Skype and otherwise. I can have somebody come to my house and cook my meals. I can go out when I want by having an Uber driver come, come get me. And remember, these are all seniors who have money, who have resources, which are the kind of seniors that are largely going to want to move on to a campus, or at least the demographic. So that's the competition that we're facing. In 10 years, it's not going to be is the, the somebody building a new building. The competition in 10 years is going to be A, that desire to stay at home, my 90-90 rule, and B, the ability to stay at home and be supported in lots of different ways. And it's just going to snowball into the future. Um, our trade show at our annual meeting, which is um, in late October this year in Indianapolis, has like 600 technology-based programs, um, services. I mean, it's just tremendously growth in the last four or five years. So it's coming and it's going to be coming in very, very quickly. Now the other side of data, remember all that Medicare that I was talking about where we're going away from fee-for-service and we're coming to these, these capitated rate programs, that's all data driven. So my example earlier of the, the uh, knee replacement and how much it costs, the skilled nursing facility that's going to participate in that network for care has to have the data to show what their quality is, the data to show what their cost is, to be able to show to the hospital and be able to prove that they are a good choice for this post-acute care. If they don't, the hospital is going to go someplace else. So our members are having to invest in technology to be able to show what their cost of care is by diagnosis. How does, much does it cost me to provide care for this, this individual diagnosis, this hip or this knee or this heart failure? Um, what are my quality metrics like rehospitalization rate, length of stay, um, the, the different metrics that you can come up with, you know, patient satisfaction, all those things. And all that has to be on data driven. That all has to be based on technology because that's what the hospital is going to expect. They're going to expect you to send over this data and so that they can take a look at it. It's not going to be enough to say, well, we do a really good job. You know, people know us as doing a really good job. That's going to be meaningless in the future. You're going to have to prove it. So the technology is also driving the health information that is required to stay in, participate, and be a player in the Medicare system as well as other health systems. <clears throat> we have some stuff for our members' uh, insights. Um, we've got an IT um, planning process. And then Thrive is a, is a program that we've developed to help our members deal with these things. It's a strategic planning tool that we, we uh, rec use. The last one is workforce. Um, as I said, I just added this last year. Um, we are having an increasing issue across the country, uh, workforce. And the reason I added it as a trend and why I think it's important is that the numbers are staggering. You know, we're going to need you know, well over 200% more people by 3030 to take care of us baby boomers. Now we hope technology will help that, but it's never going to, to supplant that. So we know we're going to need more workers, and we're having a hard time finding workers now. You know, the turnover rates for um, our members, you know, are, are 70, 80, 90, 100 percent in many job categories, and that's a tremendous amount of, of resource. We had a member out in Portland that was when I was at last uh, week. Their CFO said, you know, this is getting to be really crazy. We're, our turnover is, we need to get a handle on this. So she uh, decided to, she was going to do an analysis of what it cost them every time they had somebody leave, uh, turnover. And she, she looked at training, uh, how much it cost them to recruit new people, um, you know, the out-of-pocket costs for staff coming in. And it came to almost $7,000 per employee that turns over. And when you have dozens of people turning over every year, that adds up to some real money. So they're an example of a provider that said, okay, we're going to have to start to get a handle on this. And they, they found a program, so their applications now for employment are all online. You have to go online. And as part of the application process, there's a, there's a um, kind of a characteristics test that people all have to take. And that helps show whether this is the kind of person who would be successful working in a healthcare environment. Um, they immediately dropped the number of people that they were considering to uh, um, offer jobs to by 50%. So 50% of the people didn't show the characteristics that thought would show that they'd be successful where they were going to work. And they dropped their turnover by 12% within the first couple, three months. 
because they were hiring better people that were better qualified and more amenable to the kind of positions they were looking at. The reason that's important is that we're having now, our members are having to look at this from a strategic standpoint. It's not just an HR problem, we need more people. Our members are having to look at this whole issue of turnover and staffing and staff retention and leadership from a strategic standpoint. So the boards of directors have to start to get involved with how do we position ourselves? What do we need to do to be an employer of choice? What do we need to do to be the kind of place that people are going to want to come to work for us? And it's not just money. In fact, most of the data shows that money is only the third or fourth biggest thing. There's all kinds of uh, uh, career advancement and job satisfaction and things that are as important for um, staff. And we've got a new workforce. The millennials are much more demanding than uh, many of the generations of the past. It's not just enough to give them a paycheck. You know, they want to know how they're being benefited, what, how this fits into their career choice. So those are all strategic issues that our members are having to deal with to become more viable, to become more, more of a place that people will want to come to work for because we have to have that. We need to have that kind of, of effort on behalf of our members. So, you know, more education, uh, career ladders, technology, all these kinds of things are being developed in, and from a strategic standpoint to help us be better employers. Is it going to solve the problem? I don't know. I don't think it'll solve the problem, but it sure, certainly can make us in a better position so that we have better staff and we can retain staff. People will come here and work and will stay and not turn over. So I close with, when I do board meetings, with these questions. I pose these to the boards and say, you need to look at this as you're looking for your strategic planning. These are the kinds of things you need to consider in the future. So I pose these to you as well because you're going to be part of the strategic planning for Collington. First of all, have you developed a plan to position your campus, community, or services to be attractive to the new consumer? Are you actively looking at how do we make ourselves a place that is going to facilitate lifestyles and is going to have the programs and services that are going to be attractive to a baby boomer in 2025? Seems like a long ways away, but the planning process needs to start now to be ready for 2025. Second of all, are you looking at ways to become a resource and service provider to older adults in your community, including using technology? Remember that those scenarios about the technology, the healthcare data, you know, monitoring blood pressure, monitoring um, um, blood sugars, those kinds of things. That's only data that is meaningless unless somebody is looking at it. So somebody has to be monitoring those results. We have a member, for example, in Michigan um, who developed and set up a technology company that they install those kind of devices in people's homes and then they monitor the results. Here's how it works. Somebody has this technology set up and they can monitor all kinds of things, movements, getting out of bed, taking medicines, opening the refrigerator, um, all kinds of things. So they install this technology in a senior and they monitor the senior and the senior reports their blood pressure and the blood sugar on a regular basis and after a month or so they get kind of a baseline. They know what this person's patterns are and then what happens, you know, two months later and all of a sudden Mrs. Jones usually gets up once a night to go to the bathroom and now she gets up five times at night. They've got a red light, green light, yellow light kind of situation. A, a flag goes up, a red light, saying, uh-oh, there's a, there's a significant change in her condition. We could go out there and intervene because Mrs. Jones may have a urinary tract infection, she may be getting the flu, she may have a cold, all the kinds of things that we need to know are going on because we can intervene and keep her healthier and perhaps prevent a hospitalization or an emergency room visit by intervening right at the beginning. But it takes somebody to monitor that technology. What some of our members are starting to do when I post to boards is, why don't you become that entity that is monitoring the technology? that like our member in Michigan who's, who has developed this system and they install it in people's homes in the community and then they monitor that health. Remember the Community Center for Healthy Aging, that's one of the components. Or that may or may not be appropriate here, being involved with a village or being involved with a senior center or being involved with low-income senior housing. All the kinds of things that you can do to help take that expertise that Collington has and move it off campus and serve people that are not living on the campus but are living in the larger community. As a not-for-profit mission-driven organization, we think that that's part of your role, is to be a center that helps seniors, not only those that live on campus, 
but those seniors that live off campus. Third one, have you taken steps towards investment in systems and developing programs to assess your quality of care and cost of care? Remember, that's that Medicare, you need to understand the metrics. Do you have the systems in place to be able to show a hospital what you do and what, how you do it and what it costs? Third, what's your role in post-acute care, post care alongside hospitals and health systems in your area? You need to be active going out and talking to the hospitals and health systems to say, hey, we want to be a partner. We want to be part of your system and actually encourage members to do that. Lastly, have you developed a comprehensive approach to attracting and retaining qualified staff and developed an internal leadership development program? Again, the, the whole workforce issue has to be a strategic initiative from the board. So with that, um, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions. And the trends that are going on in both Medicare and in the community, I'd correct one thing you talked about capitation. The things you talked about aren't capitation. Those are bundled payment initiatives in Medicare. And capitation is where a payment is made per person, per plan, per yeah. year, per month. But, but those bundled payment initiatives are very potent forces of all, as are the uh, quality reporting initiatives. And those are all things that should make it easier to provide primary care and, and in, in innovative ways. And I noticed there are lots of reports from the advisory board. Uh, there's another report that I just recently read that's attributed to the uh, the corporate medical director of Erickson to talk about the desirability of having full-time physicians in, in continuing care communities or life planning communities, if you will. In fact, the Erickson folks said that uh, their model is that a community of 400 can justify a primary care physician. Uh, and my, that really was a question. I'm really interested in, in how far that's gotten and what the trend is among communities in terms of providing actual primary care physicians on campus and to be able to do the kind of monitoring you're taking. Are we seeing that happen yet or is it all talk? Um, not a lot yet, but it, the trend is definitely increasing to have physicians, um, uh, clinics on campus to help coordinate care. A good example um, that I can give you is um, one of our members down in, in uh, the Tidewaters of Virginia, <clears throat> um, they um, developed a program maybe eight or no, more than that, about 15 years ago, where they had a part-time physician um, come on campus with set hours. And then about six or seven years ago, they decided that they would um, hire a physician become on campus. Now they did it in affiliation with the Riverside Healthcare Group. So this physician is part of a health clinic, but has office hours on the campus. And then they have physicians on call uh, the rest of the time, the 24 seven. <clears throat> and they, they dropped their um, ER visits by about 50%. They dropped their hospitalizations by about a third because the, that physician knew the residents. And instead of calling the ER, they called the physician and the physician knew the resident and could help them you know, check for medicines, monitor, do some assessments, do some things that, that would have probably been done at the ER, but they could do that as a physician attending that person and save them that trip to the ER. So, and communities are starting to recognize that. So we're seeing more and more of that in some form or fashion. Some of them are doing geriatric nurse practitioners, for example, and not going to full-fledged physicians. But, or physician's assistants in some cases. But there's definitely a trend to have a higher level of Medicare, medical care on the campus, uh, understanding that, again, managing care, managing the health can save people lots of time and money, and it's something that we haven't done in the past. So the, the answer to your question is not a lot yet, but the trend certainly is in the direction of having more health care and more uh, physician's care on the campus on a regular basis. The way, for example, Collington was designed, it was designed 25, 30 years ago, take the um, assisted living, get rid of the hallway, have a central, yada, yada, yada. Is there talk or thinking or talks to the boards about how are they going to finance that? That's a great question. It's, the question is how, all the things I'm talking about, the changes, how, have we figured out how to finance that? Um, <clears throat> the answer is yes and no. Um, again, remember what I talked about early on about um, moving forward from a position of strength. 
one of the things that organizations have to do before they can undertake those kinds of things is make sure that they're as strong as they can be both operationally and financially so that they do have some resources to commit to doing that. Um, sometimes it's a, it's a leap of faith, to be honest with you, for the boards to say, you know, we know that we need to do this, so we're going to commit to do it and do the financial modeling that shows that it can be paid for over a period of time. So virtually all the boards will have a, um, an analysis that shows that it's financially feasible over a period of time before they jump. The tough time is, you know, tough decisions sometimes, do we do it or don't we do it? The, remember the thing that I think is important is that to some extent, if you don't do it, there's a question as to whether you're going to be viable in 2025. You know, you're, are there going to be people that are going to want to move in in 10, 15 years if you don't make the effort now to move your campus in that kind of direction, at least to the, the, the best that you can? Coming to the board actually has made a strategic decision to do our refinancing of our debt earlier than what would be required to address that kind of issue. And we're on a fast track to get that done. So, so um, <laughs> at least from our standpoint here, the board is very well aware of how we have to do that. It's already started on that process. Great. Uh, time for one more question. Um, You've laid out a fairly large agenda, um, both in breadth and depth. Clearly, no one institution, such as Collington, can do it all and do it all well. Can you give us some advice as to outsourcing and partnerships so that we can cover a larger area and agenda that we can do on our own? Some of the, th some of the program services, for example, um, you can work with other people in the community to help develop programs. For example, the whole move to help seniors off your campus um, and become a bigger player, that doesn't mean that you have to do all that. Sometimes it means that you can provide some of the services in conjunction with somebody else. Um, the whole health care issue, many times you can help partner with other health care providers so that you do certain things and they do other things. Um, I th we're seeing more members that are looking at, gee, we're really good at this. We're not so good at that. So let's not worry about that. Let's let somebody else do that. We'll do what we do really well. I, so I think the, 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 the long and the short the direct answer to you is, first of all, to understand your strengths. Understand what you do well and how you do that well. And then to the extent that you have deficits, either figure out, do we need to do that? Do we want to do that? Can we partner with somebody else to provide that service? Um, and move forward from that position so that you, you really start to look at building on your core strengths and then supplementing those that you think are, are necessary by outside resources. Well, great. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. The work groups and the topics that we're talking about as we develop our strategic plan, finance, human capital or workforce, health services, campus infrastructure, community outreach, which includes community and home, uh, home and community services, serving low and moderate income seniors, Collington's culture and intergenerational engagement. So I, I, as I've said to you over and over again, get used to this speed and, and scope and breadth of information coming your way. And I would implore you to continue to pay attention because just as we talked about dining services last week, about trends in the industry this week. Two weeks from now, Sean Kelly, the president and CEO of the Kindle System, will be talking about strategies across the Kindle system that we're engaging. Uh, two weeks after that, will be the CEO of Garden Spot Village, uh, Steve Lindsay, who will be talking about real world in the CCRC or life plant community ideas and notions that take these from a higher level to seeing them in action. So more to come. Please stay tuned and stay dry out there. But thanks so much, folks.